Hello everyone, I hope you're doing well. Today I'm here with Paddington, my first ever project car. For episode one of this restoration series, I'll be stripping the car down and making a start on the rush repair, beginning with the inner sill. I started by removing the seats, carpet and everything in the boot. I then used a chisel to remove the sound deadener. I jacked up the car on the right hand side to help me get a better view of the sill. When I was looking at the lip of the outer sill, I noticed that it was quite difficult to locate the spot welds, so I ended up using an angle grinder and a cutting dish to remove it instead. I removed the paint and the surface rust with a wire disc. This enabled me to see where the corroded metal started and finished. After removing the outer seal, I could see that the inner seal had actually already been repaired in the past, which did explain why I really struggled to find the spot welds on the lip. The reason I knew the inner seal had already been repaired is because whoever did it in the past had done a pretty terrible job. With a marker pen, I drew neat rectangles around the holes, ensuring that all the corroded metal would be removed. I was then able to cut a fresh piece of metal to size and spent some time going back and forth, making sure it was a tight fit. At the time, I only had a TIG welder, so it was even more critical that there were no gaps. After spending some time doing rush repair with the TIG welder, I realised that it was a very time consuming method and decided to in fact invest in a MIG welder as well. For those of you who don't know, MIG welding uses 93% argon, 5% CO2 and 2% oxygen. And TIG welding uses 100% of argon. So this is what a MIG welding torch looks like, and this is what a TIG welding torch looks like. And TIG welding uses a little tungsten electrode, and then you feed in your filler rod. Whereas MIG welding, it has a spool of wire inside it, and it con constantly feeds the wire out as, as you go. I've experimented quite a bit with doing rush repair on my Mini using my MIG welder and my TIG welder and there are definitely pros and cons to both methods. The MIG welder is much quicker, um, however the TIG welder I'd say is more precise and you have more control over heat. The biggest con of using a MIG welder is probably the fact that you obviously have quite a lot of material afterwards to remove with an angle grinder. The con to using a TIG welder is that because I'm welding very thin sheet metal, I find it's actually quite easy to, to distort because you're having to turn the settings right down as pretty much as low as they can go uh, so that you don't burn holes through the metal. But then that also means it takes much longer to do the weld, which in doing so exposes it to more heat. Hello everyone, we're back here in the workshop once again with my car project Paddington and this is episode two of my restoration series. Since episode one, I have finished repairing the inner sill on the right hand side of the car, but today we are going to start repairing the floor before I go on to move the rear subframe in order to access some more rust at the rear of the car. Even for a 1999 model, as floor rust goes, this is pretty good. The majority of the corroded metal was located around the drain holes and the slinging brackets. These are the Mini's slinging brackets and they were designed to transport the empty body of the Mini around the factory during production. However, they are often mistaken for the car's jacking point and my car has buckled in at the floor where someone has tried to use these to jack up the Mini. Something I wish I had invested in sooner was this air reciprocating saw. Since I've used this to cut out smaller sections that are often curved, this has been so much easier. So here I am again cutting more fresh metal, welding and grinding away any excess welds. The first step to repairing rust on any car is to ensure you have the correct gauge of metal. My Mini uses 0.8mm thick metal. Overlapping metal, in my opinion, is not an option. Butt welds are the way to go as it is the most effective way to prevent rust long term. 
It is crucial to spread out your tack welds and distribute the heat evenly by welding on opposite edges. Continue doing short bursts until you have left no gaps. A light can be placed behind the metal to check for pinprick holes, which is basically tiny little holes that are left in the metal. But you can just go over those by welding and grinding back again. It's been really nice moving on to the next section of rush repair. I feel I'm gradually beginning to see the light at the end of the tunnel and I'm really looking forward to being able to begin on the mechanical work. Thank you for watching and I'll see you back here in the workshop for episode three. Welcome back to the workshop. Today we are finally moving on to some mechanical work and removing the rear subframe on my classic mini. But before we get started, I'd like to take a moment to thank all of you for your incredible support. Yesterday, I uploaded my first video across all of my socials and within 24 hours, 20,000 of you had watched and engaged with my content. Thank you so much for all your amazing comments. All right, that's enough talking for me. Let's get started with the removal of the rear subframe. From the moment I first got this mini, I knew I'd need to remove the rear subframe due to some rust hiding behind it. To prepare for this, I've been regularly oiling the mounting bolts as these bolts are notorious for seizing and snapping. I started by setting up my wheel chocks to prepare for jacking up the mini from the rear. Since removing the rear subframe means there will be no structural areas for the jack stands, I'll need to distribute the load with a piece of wood across the width of the car. In order to do this, I removed the exhaust, the handbrake cable, and disconnected the brake and fuel lines. A little tip to get more leverage on stubborn bolts such as these ones I came across is to use a second spanner. Next, I disconnected the upper shop mount points and placed a jack under each end of the subframe. I then loosened the bolts holding it in place. With some butane heat, back and forth persuasion and more WD-40, most of the bolts came loose except for one. So I drilled off the hex head and then used a punch to remove it. By using heat, the idea is to expand the metal around the shank of the bolt. With the help of Alex, we lowered the subframe slowly to the ground. I plan to get it sandblasted and powder coated as this is cheaper than buying a new one and the condition isn't really that bad. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you back here in the workshop for episode four. Welcome back to the workshop. This is the video I have been so excited to make for you guys. Today, I'll be stripping the engine out of my Mini. I'd like to ask you guys what you think I should do with my engine and my Mini in general. What sympathetic non-track mods do you think I should make? Are there any specific parts that you'd recommend? I know I want to give my Mini a little bit of extra power, but I don't want to make it unreliable. So let me know what you guys think. If you haven't already, I highly recommend getting yourself the correct Haynes manual for your Mini. I disconnected the battery and then drained the coolant and engine oil. After that, I removed the bonnet, but a quick tip is to mark the outline of the hinge before removing it. This will make refitting the bonnet much easier later on. Another tip for beginners is to keep the bolts you remove in separate labeled bags and take reference photos as you go. Also, don't forget to label electrical connections and hoses to keep track of where everything goes. The first thing to come out of the engine bay was the starter motor and alternator. Next, I removed the air filter housing and disconnected the throttle cable from the throttle cam. Then I tackled the ECU, master cylinder, brake servo and pressure reducing valve making sure to carefully label the brake lines. After this, it was time to remove the radiator, coolant expansion tank, tie bar, earth strap, clutch slave cylinder, and gear selector rod. At this point, it was down to just four mountain bolts holding the engine in place. 
I used wing protectors to avoid scratching the paintwork whilst removing the engine. I also found some sensible lifting points to take the weight off the engine and position the crane centrally. I carefully started lifting the engine out from the bay and asked Craig and Alex to help guide it from the back. It was all hands on deck and we carefully maneuvered the engine out and just like that, we did it. The engine is out. Now that the engine is out, I can start prepping everything for sandblasting and powder coating. I'll get all the parts together and take them to be cleaned up in one go. That's all I've got for today. Thank you so much for watching and don't forget to comment down below what modifications you think I should make to my mini. I'll see you back here in the workshop for episode five. Welcome back to the workshop. Since removing the engine, I've been busy preparing both the front and rear subframe for sandblasting and powder coating. This is by far the most effective way to protect the metal and ensure it lasts for years to come. In this video, I'll show you how to remove the front subframe and in the next video, I'll be taking both the subframes to the sandblasters. They've agreed to let me sandblast them myself, which is going to be an exciting learning experience. So stay tuned for that. To start, I removed the wishbones and brake calipers. The bolts were extremely stubborn, so it took me a fair bit of patience and elbow grease to get them loose. Next, I tackled the top nuts on the shocks. Once that was done, I positioned the axles out of the way and used a piece of wood to evenly distribute the weight of the mini shell. This setup freed the front subframe ready for removal. To safely lower the subframe, I supported the weight using two jacks. From there, I began to disconnect all the mounts and once everything was unbolted, I carefully lowered the subframe to the ground, making sure it came down evenly without any issues. With the subframe out, I started stripping off all the smaller components to get it ready for sandblasting. Now it is prepped and ready to go. Thank you so much for watching and don't forget to stay tuned for the next video where I will be sandblasting and powder coating for the first time ever. Welcome back to the workshop. Today we're tackling something I've been looking forward to for a long time. Shot blasting and powder coating my own mini subframes. I'm at Curdford Shot Blasting where I've been given the opportunity to learn and do it myself for the very first time. I've used shot blasters before but never anything as massive or as vintage as this setup. This machine I worked was built in 1985. To start, I placed the first subframe inside and began stripping away the old paint to reveal the bare metal beneath. We used 100 grit chilled iron for the blasting. The process was super satisfying and quicker than I expected. However, I did uncover some rust on the rear subframe. To address the rust, I cut out the corroded sections and welded in the fresh steel. When they say powder, they aren't kidding. You quite literally spray a layer of powder particles over the part you are coating. This is done using an electric charge. Similarly to welding, you use an earth clamp on the metal surface, which negatively charges the powder, thus attracting it to the metal part using an electric charge. Once the part was fully coated in primer, we baked it in an oven at 160 degrees for 10 minutes. At this stage, the powder melts and chemically bonds to the metal. For the primer layer, we aimed for a green cure, which leaves it slightly tacky. This ensures the top coat adheres properly, otherwise it could flake off. After the primer, we applied the satin black top coat using the same process. 
This time the oven was set to 190 degrees Celsius. The part was left in for 10 minutes after reaching 180 degrees Celsius. This took around 40 minutes in total. And here are the final results. My freshly blasted and powder coated subframes ready to be reinstalled.